Welcome to Petability. I'm your host, Kathy Simons. And I'm your host, Chris Cranston. Our podcast provides interviews and information to help your pets live their best lives. Hello, hello, hello. I'd like to welcome our guests, Amy Campbell and Lillian Chardelli to Petability. Welcome. <laughs> Hi. Hey. So these two characters co-own a business in Atlanta, Georgia called Behave Atlanta that has a unique approach. Behave Atlanta takes one behaviorist and adds one trainer to make a team that can address your pet's greatest needs. Amy Campbell is a certified pet dog trainer and brings over 10 years experience in dog services and Lillian Chardelli an associate certified applied animal behaviorist has researched animal behavior across many species focusing on individual welfare they've joined forces to help you understand behavior and how to modify it and i thought one of the most interesting things i was like an aha when i was reading your website was the behavior is the why and the trainer is the how i thought that is such a simple but profound way of thinking about these things. So just as they intersected two related fields of expertise, we are intersecting their expertise as behaviorists and trainers with our focus on physical rehabilitation to help your pets live their best lives. It's a shared mission. The combination of body and soul, physical and emotional, that cannot be compartmentalized as each affects and impacts the other. Welcome again. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. So would either of you like to expound a little bit on, on how we know each other and how we found each other and, and that good stuff so our listeners know the, the relationship? Sure, I'd be happy to. So Chris and I met in Boston um, when I was living in Boston and she was running her physical therapy space. I worked for her as a massage therapist working with the um, dogs in rehab and through that relationship met Lillian who began working there as well. Right, and we all worked with Amy's dog, Rory. That's right, the amazing Rory. Yes, as, as you said, known to be one of those best dogs ever types. Yes, he, he is. I, I will not argue with you. <laughs> and he's super, <laughs> super handsome, too. That's right, that's right. You can see lots of pictures of him on our website. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I'm so excited to have you both here. I love the combination of the trainer and the behavior working together, collaborating together. You don't often see that. Um, uh, so I'm really excited about this. And, and I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about certain things that affect behavior and how it affects you know, a dog's overall health. And in, in particular, fear and anxiety, you know, and, and maybe some of these long-term stressors for dogs such as, you know, chronic chronic pain. So um, we know that these, these things have an effect on the dog psychologically and that that, that, that can affect the behavior. Um, and then I know that we can't completely eliminate, you know, all stressors, but, I, but there are things that we can do to, to mitigate these things. And I think that positive training um, is, is one of those areas. So um, this is going to help our dogs, you know, build their confidence and handling new experiences and, and improving their overall quality of health. Right. I'm equally excited, ladies. So um, let's get to it. So why is appropriate behavior important for health? Can you narrow that down for us? Yeah, well, there's a, there's a lot that we could talk about there. So um, when you think about behavior, it's really how your dog is cooperating with their person and how they are at home and out in the world. So there are things like, let's say, for instance, like leash training. So a lot of dogs we work with who are very, very well-mannered dogs, really nice dogs, let's say they don't have any aggression or reactivity, they still need leash manners because if you're going to go out and walk on a leash, you have the potential to strain your neck, to, you know, walk into the road where there's, you know, danger of cars. All of these kind of things um, can happen. And so leash walking is one of those things are, where I just think about, this is really important for health, is being able to walk well on leash. And an example I often use um, for my clients when I'm teaching leash walking is that dogs are pretty much like us at the airport walking behind the slowest person ever with their rolly bag. 
<laughs> it's, like so, it's so frustrating for our dogs to walk at our speed. Most dogs would like to walk much, much faster or run, right? And right. so we're, we're teaching them this kind of like impulse control on the move. It's different than just laying on your bed still, but it is really important to be able to walk well so that you're not, yeah, you could have neck pain. Dogs can have neck pain. I have, I have seen that as a massage therapist. There's also other kind of injuries that could happen from, from not walking well on leash. That is a great analogy and a great <laughs> example, mm -hmm. Amy, because as you said that, I was I could envision it perfectly where, you know, you start to step around to the right to go past them and then all of a sudden they veer right and then you go back to the left and then they do like a 180 back into you, you slam into each other. Mm -hmm. Oh, yep. yeah. Yep. Yep. And that's how so many dogs walk, right? They're like, I'll just go around this. Oh, no, now I can't do that. Oh, I just really, really want to go. Just go. <laughs> yes, yes. And and I, I do think that, you know, all of us, you know, when we really think about it, um, you know, the the training, the appropriate behavior and training is is paramount for the obvious things like preventing um, accidents and and mm -hmm. such. You know, you, you talked about, you know, not darting into the street and, um, and also the fact that so many dogs do have neck pain that I don't even think we appreciate. Um, I think we're just starting to, to realize how much neck and spinal pain there is in, in dogs. But yes, it could be from uh, malbehaviors or also, you know, if they're constantly um, on your left side and you have a certain kind of, uh, you know, leash or harness that it could be just mm -hmm. putting that same stress over and over and over again. So just being aware of, of all of these types of things. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think another, you know, like you brought up with the safety of the car, it's like learning a good recall is so important. You want to be able to call your dog. You want to have your dog be able to go to a, like a fenced in dog park and come back to you or be out in a field and come back to you. So a strong recall is something that I train all the time and I love to train because I'm like, this is the thing that gets your dog to go on hikes with you. That lets them have these fun adventures like going to the park, right? Um, so, but it's so important because if you think about like in a dog park situation, there could be, there could be a fight. There could be somebody leaving the gate open. You need that recall at that time to keep your dog safe. Yeah. I think we, I think we also need to, uh, you know, sometimes I see people there, they're frustrated because they're calling their dog and they're calling their dog and their dog won't come back. And what I want people to remember when they're learning about recalls or when you guys are, you know, teaching your dogs recalls is not to punish them when they come back. You know, I know that there might, there might be that, that, that like, oh, I'm so angry with you, you know, <laughs> why did you listen to me? Know. You know, so, but I want people to remember, you know, I, I think that it's important to, for, for the owners to understand that it needs to be a good experience. Coming back to you is better than whatever is out there. Coming back to you is, is better than the squirrel or better than the, you know, the dog fight or whatever. And, yeah, and that's I, totally right. Yeah. One thing that we say is we say, you know, if you're going to put your dog in the bath, if you're going to clip their nails, if you're going to do something they don't like, don't use the word come. Just go oh. and lure them with a treat. Use something, you know, use the leash because you don't want come to be right. pushed. You want it to always be like, yay, I just went to mom and it was great. <laughs> I got to go back and play or I got to have treats or I got to do something else fun. Oh, I didn't even think of that. I'm going to have to change that for the right. bath because right. I will also tell my dog to come after I just told people to make it positive. Yes. <laughs> but yes, you, but it's something simple that you can just, um, that can be better. You know, you can make your recalls better and solid if you, if you, you know, remove that negative, like I'm going to cut your nails and after you come to me. So like you come to me and it's going to be great. It's going to be the best ever. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think one of the ironies too is, Every trainer I talk to, just as you said, Amy, I love to teach recall. And they will also say, it is one of the easiest things to teach. Then why on earth do 90% of pet owners have such a poor recall? <laughs> so there, there seems to be a disconnect between what the trainers say and what we're able to actually do and execute. Right. Um, yeah, I think that. That's true. And one of the things that I would say is that I feel like a lot of people don't understand the difference between teaching a behavior at, say, a kindergarten level and then real life scenarios that are actually like senior high or grad school even. Um, and they're not really working their dog up through these different levels of learning. That's one thing about training that's so interesting for me is it's simple to say, okay, I'll show you how to do this thing. Maybe it only takes two or three minutes. But learning how to work through distractions, learning how to work at a distance, learning how to work with duration, 
those are really, really teaching our dogs like, okay, now they're in fourth grade as far as like their recall mm. skills. They can do from this distance. They can do when other dogs are around. So that's one of the things that I see break down a lot, Chris, is that people learn the very basic and then they expect that to work in harder scenarios and it's just not going to. Mm. I wonder if what, what happened, do you think that what ha might occur also is we're, maybe we're teaching dogs to avoid the behavior rather than learning what we want them to do? Do you think that's a possibility? Are we maybe teaching the dog if, I don't condone this, but if you were trying teaching the dog to, and you were using a leash correction, but maybe you're teaching the dog to avoid the leash correction rather than actually teaching the dog to walk with you? Yeah, I do think that that happens some. And I think what else happens is that um, the person will get really nervous if their dog is off leash. And so sometimes that anxiety will bring up something in the dog where they're like, you know what? I don't know if I want to go over there. Mom, mm. she's in a happy voice, but she also seems really stressed out right now. Like, <laughs> or like, this is the end of play. And so that's something that yes. I'm going to let Lillian jump in here in a second. But yes, that's Lillian. Lillian and I say is you don't want the come to be the end of play. So you always want to call them over and then send them back because dogs are predict, they're predicting that that's going, oh, you, ca you called me over at the dog park. Now we're going to leave. You know what? I'm just not going to come over yes. to you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. I, um, I agree. And you guys, Amy and Kathy, you said a couple of things that fit well into the role of stress and the role of our behavior and our dog's health. So uh, what Amy brought up is a lot of the time in puppy classes and and when you first start training your dog, come is, and recall is really easy because come to the dog means come get a treat. And then in real life, it starts to mean stop doing that fun thing and come over here and get nothing. Mm -hmm. And so Bummer. it is not surprising that people uh, start having a hard time with it later on because they're not rewarding for it anymore. And it is almost always used to stop a dog from doing something that that dog is enjoying doing. So that can be uh, one of the reasons that it tends to break down as dogs get older. And then the other part of it is uh, what actually both Amy and Kathy brought up is when you're frustrated or you're afraid and you're yelling to your dog, they notice that and they understand that. Um, they're reading your voice. They might be looking at your body language, but they can tell that you're stressed out by something and they're going to respond to that. And it can happen sort of in a really short uh, distant scenario. So let's say your dog is not very well behaved on leash. You see another dog come and you get stressed and tighten up. They understand that you just tightened up the leash and now rather than thinking, oh, don't worry, she's just afraid that I'm going to do something crazy, but I'm not <laughs> going to do anything crazy. They're like, what are you afraid of? Oh my God, there's a dog and you're afraid of it. I need to be afraid too. And it just <laughs> compounds that situation. So <clears throat> stress is, is pretty contagious in dogs and we just I just read a paper about that in Nature that just came out by Roth et al and it goes over the fact that <clears throat> both long-term and short-term stress is picked up by our dogs and they are showing high cortisol levels especially if they have owners that have also high cortisol levels so the bottom line there is that you just your stress is contagious to your dog and they're going to be aware of it and a way to combat that is through training and behavior. Because if we want to have a window into our dog's mental health and be able to communicate to them that things are okay and what we would really like them to do, we need a communication tool and that's gonna have to be training. So teaching your dog to walk loosely on leash will prevent your stress in that situation and then your dog will get that positive, comfortable feedback of a loose leash or relaxed walk they'll hear your voice being relaxed and they'll be better behaved. So it kind of can snowball in either direction. The calmer you are, the calmer your dog is, the better behaved they will be versus the more stressed out you are, the more stressed out your dog's gonna be, the worse behaved they're gonna be. And you'll get it to a point where you feel like you can't control them in certain situations. They're not gonna sit, they're not coming to you when you're calling and you're getting more and more frustrated and they're not learning anything good. So we really like to use good behavior to set up a life for that dog that has a good communication tool with you and good mental health and confidence so that everybody in the whole system is calmer and happier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, don't I, think, think, I don't think we give uh, dogs enough credit for, um, well, we do, but maybe in general, <laughs> we do, 
uh, for how incredibly intuitive they are to your body language, your facial expressions. Um, I mean, I, they must spend an incredible amount of time just studying their owners and, and what their body language means and their facial expressions and certain actions mean. Um, they, they spend a lot more time, you know, studying us probably than we do them. So right. you know, they're extremely intuitive. Mm -hmm. They definitely do do that because A, they've evolved. We've selected them to do that. We kept right. and bred the dogs that were better at understanding us. Um, they also, an example I like to give is if you've ever talked to somebody with a, who speaks a different language and you're kind of trying to guess what they're saying. So <laughs> they say something, or maybe you didn't, they speak your language and you weren't even listening and you just kind of look at their face and they're like, yes mm -hmm. right <laughs> and you kind of guess from just the look on their face what you should have said or done and that's all they have like they're reading our body because they don't understand our words so they have to guess and they get very good at it and then we don't realize it because we're so reliant on language that sometimes we won't even pay attention to a person's body language when they're saying something that is completely opposite of how they're acting Right. But dogs don't have that luxury. They don't really understand. So they're primarily learning who you are, how you act, and what are the consequences of certain tones of voice. Wow. I, uh, when I was doing physical rehab in my clinic, I often would remind the pet owners that dogs are, the quote I use was masters of body language. So that they would, you know, suddenly realize that everything that they, they did, you know, meant something to their, their pet, as you suggested. And, and Kathy, I, I've heard you say many times um, that uh, our pets are emotional barometers. Is that right. the term right. you use? So, yeah. I think that's a good one too. And then on your website, guys, you say um, a happy animal and a harmonious home. So I think, you know, that's what we're, we're all striving for, you know, whether it's uh, physical or emotional, but we want them to, to be happy. And when they're happy, we're happy and the home is harmonious and then it goes the opposite direction too. So, yeah. Can we, um, do you think we could talk a little bit about the, um, the negative, uh, physical effects of stress on dogs. So, you know, um, I, I'm wondering even if, if we can talk about is this, if this is even true, do you, is the dog that is emotionally sound have less physical issues, less physical ailments? So if you have a good emotional balance, is, is your immune system stronger? Um, do you have less GI stress, things like that? What, what negative effects are we going to see physically from, the, from these stressors or anxiety? Yeah, so um, a lot of the time, we'll see certain ones immediately. So you'll see GI distress, certainly. We see a lot of diarrhea, unfortunately, right in the beginning when there's a big stressor or even a change. Um, that's, that's a pretty good different type of barometer. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> that, that something has distressed them, maybe not long-term, but it, it, it's a pretty good signal that they're upset. And a lot of the time uh, we'll explain to owners, like this is actually normal. Don't, you don't need to rush your dog to the vet if they had diarrhea and, and there was a huge change in your environment, you moved, like that could be really due to um, a significant environmental change. Um, you could also see a loss of appetite and if it is enduring um, a, a loss of weight as a result, I would think that their immune systems would be negatively impacted. I'm not actually sure. I haven't looked into the research on that, but that is what happens in humans. So one would think that prolonged high cortisol would definitely have physical effects. And certainly their emotional balance is not going to be great because they're not going to be thinking through situations. They're going to be reacting because they're going to be so um, activated and so nervous that every time they run into something, it's kind of going to be a knee-jerk fight-or-flight situation rather than a more calm, wait, what do I do? Oh, wait, I can walk away calmly. I can go into my crate. I can sit behind my owner rather than I need to bark, I need to lunge, I need to sprint away. Mm -hmm. So um, certainly the emotional balance is something we work on with stress and dogs with fear and anxiety. Yeah, and one thing we really like to do is we like to do what's called the relaxation protocol. 
we like to teach dogs how to go to their bed and relax or go in their crate and relax. And something that's been crazy during this quarantine time is that a lot of dogs are not getting any substantial rest because it used to be the dog is napping for most of the day when the people were at work, the house was quiet, things are very chill. Now everyone's home and if you've got a family, you got, you know, kids, you got, you know, you're all there, you're all working, all this energy, a lot of dogs aren't getting adequate rest. And it's something that, just for example, like I had a foster dog staying with me and she went to a home. It was, you know, five kids. It was a very busy home. They were all there. There was no time that they were out of the house because we're all in our pandemic quarantine. And she wouldn't even lay down on her own. She would, she, her stress was leading her to pant constantly, pace around. And so she never got rest. And, you know, they said, she's getting worse instead of getting better. And I said, yeah, she, she hasn't had adequate rest. She hasn't been able to calm herself down. And so you think about that dog is a dog in a new situation that's unsettled, but there are dogs who are stressed to that level in their regular life. And so they're not getting rest, right? They're pacing around too much. There are, there are physical um, physical, negative physical effects from that kind of thing. I think my dog is tired of looking at my face all day too, because we've been <laughs> quarantined together, but you make a really good point. Um, dogs need that downtime and dogs need good rest just like people do, right? Mm -hmm. And they will sleep through short stints throughout the day, mm -hmm. unlike people. Well, maybe some people, but <laughs> they, right. have to, they have to be able to sleep in short outs throughout the day to to get the appropriate rest that they need as well as have their nighttime you know uh, through the night sleep as well so that's a really good point that they're maybe these dogs aren't getting enough rest or sleep or downtime and, and right, to, to, right. to find a place to be calm and quiet you know yeah, and then the alternative of that, what we see sometimes is dogs that really need a job, they really need more to do, and they're very bored, and so they're agitated, and they're worked up, and that can have also, like, negative physical consequences. Mm. They're looking for stuff. They might even, you know, get into the trash, get something dangerous because they're so bored. They're always like, I need something else to do, or they're constantly on alert. So you've got a German Shepherd or a Great Pyrenees, somebody who's used to guarding, that's what they're, that's what they're inside. They're telling them, this is what you're supposed to be doing. They're not getting any release of that. And so they might be on high alert all the time, keeping their cortisol levels up, which we know has a negative effect on the system. Yeah. And like you said, the work from home, you know, the parents are there all the time. And, and, you know, I was thinking about this too, like as the, the lockdown, you know, ended and, and, you know, people were transitioning back to work. I, I can imagine there's also a fair amount of separation anxiety. So it can go both directions, you know, and right. in terms of, of those behaviors and, and such. So it can be bad when there's too much people and kids and grandpa and grandma, and it can be, you know, bad when like, a sudden change and, and everybody goes back to work again. So, um, so we've thrown this word cortisol around quite a bit and, you know, I'm not even sure that I know a, a, an appropriate def definition. I have an idea, but, um, Lily, maybe you can talk a little bit about what exactly cortisol is and why it's so important. And we keep mentioning it. Sure. So cortisol is a stress hormone and it basically, uh, is elevated in your bloodstream when something stressful happens, even it could be good stress or bad stress. So it doesn't really matter. It could be you got all excited because you, your friend came over or for your dog, their dog friend came over, or they got really stressed out because their dog enemy came over. And any of these things will spike cortisol. And that's normal function that's supposed to happen, but it can take a few days for that cortisol level to go back down. So if your dog is having a lot of episodes where that cortisol is spiking, that's never going to go down and it's never going to go down to a level where um, we need it to go so they can have an appropriate response to these sorts of uh, little stressors and little triggers. So what we like to give an example of is uh, we say you have a fuse at the beginning of the day and let's say as a human being, my fuse is full, I woke up, had a good night's sleep, and then I go downstairs and I spill my coffee and it burns up a little bit of my fuse. And then I'm driving to work and I get rear-ended and then that burns up a whole bunch of my fuse. And all I have left for the rest of the workday is this little tiny bit of fuse at the end and everything's going fine. I come home and uh, my friend makes some joke 
like, oh, you look good today, and I just flip out. I have a horrible reaction because I've had a horrible day, and I have no energy left for even a little joke. And that's kind of what's happening with a lot of dogs that have prolonged stress. All these little encounters throughout the day um, or throughout the week are stressing them out, and they're never getting to a point where they can actually feel good and recover. So something that might have caused a mild reaction before, like a dog barking at them, is now going to just shoot them to an even bigger reaction. And then that kind of continues, where that big reaction spiked their cortisol again, and now we're set back and we need to wait another few days for it to go down. So what we've been recommending to a lot of clients recently is a cortisol vacation, where we basically say, you need to create a zen zone. Don't try to put your dog in situations for a while. Don't try to work on it. Just let them relax and let them have a nap. If you're somebody who had been staying at home during the pandemic, we'd recommend go outside, leave them inside, let them, let them reset. Because even good things like having your owner home all day is something that's exciting for them and they're really not having time to regulate and bring everything just down to a workable level. Yeah. I have a couple yeah. of, of, of examples here I, because again, every time, you know, I, I, I'm a lifelong learner, just like our, our pets, right? They can mm -hmm. learn new tricks throughout their mm -hmm. lifetime. But, you know, you were talking about, um, you know, even, even good things, even exciting things. So uh, my dog Baxter is softer by nature than, than the female. They both go to agility. He gets so excited when he goes, but not until this moment have I realized that if I do agility too many times in a given week, he starts to shut down. Uh, mm -hmm. He starts to tremble. We, nobody can figure out what, what's going on. Why is he, you know, acting this way? Did something happen? And we can never really put a finger on it because there wasn't a direct cause effect. But maybe, again, his cortisol levels were, were high. You know, we did agility two days in a row and then skipped a day and then went back again to a different event. And he just never had time to reset. And, um, you know, you're, you're talking about the fuse too. I mean, that makes complete sense. And, you know, the blowing the fuse, right? It, you get to a threshold where, where a seemingly non-noxious thing will just, you know, flip you or your dog out. I love that analogy. So, Anyway, that's great stuff, yeah, guys. It, you know, makes me um, think about working with my my uh, blind dogs too. That um, you know, I, I want to make sure that these dogs don't that when you are training or when you're working with these blind dogs that they don't get over thresholds mm -hmm. so often that they're just fizzling out. You know, it's like you guys said earlier. When I'm starting with a kindergarten class. I don't want to give my dog PhD level stuff to do mm -hmm. and he needs a break. Um, so in particularly with blind dogs as well, we, we don't want those, they need a cortisol vacation just like everybody else, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's something that, you know, I find us recommending it more and more, but I think it's good in so many situations. Um, and it is interesting to think about like your example, Chris, I think that makes a lot of sense. Like Baxter's cool, he can deal with it really well if it's happening once, but the second time and the third time in a short, you know, a week Span. or whatever, a couple mm -hmm. of days can be hard. And I think it makes it, you know, it, it makes me think we really want to consider that if our dogs are in, you know, rally or obedience or they're, they're competing and, you know, agility and different things like that. I think sometimes as the person, we enjoy that so much that we're like, oh, let's do it more. But for the dog, mm -hmm. it can be too much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do you want to talk a little bit about, um, being able to to kind of read that and you know how much is too much and and you know what what signs we should look for and you know i guess especially as it relates to uh things like handling and you know touching um you know and their tolerance for that because this is a good example too you know i i know i am a i am a physical therapist i use my hands a lot of times with people and pets I don't really like massage myself. I don't like people touching me so much. A hug's fine, but you know, and dogs are similar, right? So. Yeah, yeah, that's really true. I mean, I think a lot of times we do need to teach our dogs to be comfortable with handling. And we talk about like important skills for your dog's health, like being able to be handled, being able to be touched in different areas is really important. Um, there are so many dogs who don't like to have their their feet touched or their hands touched, right? Because of nail clipping. 
And what, what we see is that, that um, most dogs are, they are taken to the groomer, the you know person puts them in the noose or whatever, and they trim their mm -hmm. nails, and, and they, they have to get it done, right? The groomer has to get it done. That's what the client is expecting. And so there is a negative association a lot of times for animals, and we may or may not think about it. You know, if our dog's been groomed, maybe, maybe the dog has been afraid at that grooming salon, but we don't really, we don't really know that, right? Um, so there are some things like that, like we do want to make a positive association. So something that um, we talk about a lot for puppies, but it can be true even for older dogs is making sure that your dog understands that handling is positive. And what that means is looking at your dog and reading their body language. Like are their ears going back? Is their tail going down? Are they getting stiff? Are they doing a side eye? Like, um, do they look really happy, relaxed, kind of like wiggly jello dog and all of a sudden now they're like a statue, right? Your dog is not comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, so understanding like how to look for those signs, that's something that Lily and I like to do quite a bit is we talk about body language. We send people these great body language um, charts and kind of look at, look at what your dog might look like when they're uncomfortable so that you as the person can recognize that and then say, you know what, my dog is uncomfortable when I lift up his paw, like, is there something going on or can we work on this? Because, you know, it may be that at some point there's an injury and a vet and a bunch of people who your dog doesn't even know have to start getting in there and <laughs> touching it. Right. And it may be a very scary thing. Yeah. So in working on it, are you, are you associating um, a positive reinforcer, food, toy, something like that, something good with the you know, through that process? Yes. So yeah, we, we want to make the, um, we want to make the situation positive. Um, and so we're going to pair a treat often. You can use a toy, but a treat is usually easiest, especially if you've got a food motivated dog. And so the way that it goes is that I have some treats kind of ready to go. I reach towards my, towards my dog's paw, let's say for that example. Mm -hmm. And, and as I'm doing that, then I can use my marker like a yes or a click and then feed a treat. Um, depending on how comfortable my dog is, if my dog is really scared of me reaching for their paw, I might even just like move my hand towards the paw and not even touch the paw and then like yes and treat because my dog's willing to stay there while it's happening versus mm -hmm. leaving the room. Yeah, and I'd like to add a little bit to that because that's the training portion. And then we also usually advocate for a management side when you're not actually working with your dog or asking them to do particular things, you're changing the environment or you're changing something about what you're doing. Um, <clears throat> so we have a lot of management tools also to help dogs with stress. One of them is creating a clear routine that has predictability and includes downtime. So what had been happening during the pandemic was there was no downtime. This time that dogs had relied on to rest was no longer happening and they couldn't predict when owners were going to be around or not. So they felt the need to kind of be on all the time. And so even if you're working from home and you don't normally and you'll need to go back, we recommend having time where you put the dog in a crate or you ignore them, you ask them to settle down. And that sort of sets up a routine of, okay, I'm going to go lie down at this time. I'm going to take breaks because the environment is set up and the routine is set up so that they know to do it. We also recommend implementing breaks during play. So we have a lot of dogs that get too excited when they're playing. And so we'll ask the owner to time it for maybe three minutes, three seconds, depends on the animal and the time, and then say, okay, take a break, and they're gonna do something else. They might walk over to the water bowl in hopes that the dog will go take water, but we really want to create time for the dog to disengage or the cat or whatever animal you're working with. And then another part of it is observing the dog's behavior and always giving them space to move away. We never want to have the animals trapped or feel like they have to endure something as much as possible. Obviously with certain procedures, dogs don't really get a choice or cats, but what we like is to say, if you're petting your dog and you take a break, do they actually come back to you or do they move away? Are they wanting to be pet or are you wanting to pet them? So always giving an escape route and also reinforcing that escape. So if your dog chooses to go upstairs, to walk away, go lie down, don't go wake them up again and make them play. <laughs> Make that a positive experience. You know, them up the stairs. Stairs. Yeah. Where are you going? Where are you going? I want to play with you. <laughs> um, you know, when I'm out walking my dog, I have a I have a pug, and he is, 
he's so cute. Your 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 mind can't even grasp it. That's how cute. He is. <laughs> but because of because of that, people want to grab him and touch him and pat him. And oftentimes he makes the decision to get behind me rather mm-hmm. than engage with with people who want to pat him. And I respect that. And I think for me, it what I'm trying to convey to him too is I respect that you don't want to be touched. I'm I'm going to establish my role as a leader in a positive way by saying I got this. You don't have to engage. Mm-hmm. You know. So sorry if people get offended, they get offended. <laughs> right, but, right. But, well, I, but I make he makes a decision to retreat, and I and I respect that. And I say you know he doesn't want to be patted. Yeah, it's really good, and we definitely advocate for that. That owners will speak up for their pets. I think a lot of times people don't know how to read body language. And so yeah. the person who, who can read body language needs to say aloud, oh, the dog's feeling nervous or, oh, we're just going to keep walking. We don't want to say hi today or yeah, whatever exactly. it is. Yeah. I had a, a, a I, my last dog, my, my dog I have now has vision, but the dog I had before that did not have vision. He was, he was blind at about the age of six years old. And we would go out every day and walk the neighborhood. And every day, a little girl would start running over going, mm-hmm. <laughs> And every day I would stop her and say, nope, it's not going to happen. And the mom was always offended. But can you imagine what her mom would think if I started running down the street going, little girl, and like like, try to like grab her kid. Like, can you imagine the scenario in her head, right? But, but that's, that's the respect my, I want my dog to, to have that kind of respect. I wouldn't run up to your child screaming and yelling. My dog can't see. I don't want him to be frightened, startled, or reactive to people. So we're going to respect that he doesn't want to be touched because you're too much for him. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's a little bit of like, it goes both ways, right? Like I have, right. like, I want my dog to be comfortable with being pet, but I also want to say, Hey, he doesn't want to be pet. He doesn't yep. know you. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And I think that uh, the mistake that a lot of other people make, and we're kind of going in a different direction, but I often hear my dog's fine. My dog's friendly. And they don't think about the, the dog that they're interacting with, you know? Um, so there's that scenario a lot yeah. of times that, you know, my dog's very friendly, but again, uh, you know, gets a little intimidated quickly. So I, I'm right, also his right. advocate. So Yeah. And I always say, well, what do you, what do you mean by friendly? Like, does he mm. like dogs coming up to him? Let's just break it down and make it very specific. So my dog, right. my dog is a very friendly dog. No, he does not like dogs charging up to him. Like, no, he is not going to be happy about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got you. Can so, we go back? Can we circle back to talking about the bodily, body handling for a bit, guys? Is that okay? Yeah. Because yeah. um, as a veterinary technician, I want to say that um, I think it's very important for the, to get our dogs to have that tolerance of bodily body handling because it makes examinations so much less stressful mm-hmm. and so and we get so much more out of the the visit with us if if we're able to handle the dog right um, so what we encourage often is these friendly visits because I think that these enhance these dogs um, exams quite a bit so we if your dog is frightened of coming to the vet or has some kind of you know that white coat fear or when they pull up they're like oh, bad things happen here we encourage people to come during the day throughout you know a couple of days a week and just come in and have the dog uh, or cat greeted by the staff um, very low-key and then leave maybe they get a treat maybe they get patted um, and then they go um, and then we progress very slowly from that stage to maybe um, patting your dog while they're sitting in an exam room and then, mm-hmm. you know, get to go. So, and, and then teaching dogs things like voluntary chin rests um, makes it easier for dogs to go, oh, I know what that is. That, that doesn't lead to anything bad. You know, if I'm holding, if you've got your chin in my hand and I'm looking at your eye um, and then you get a cookie, like it predicts a cookie every time, um, that makes for better handling. And, and I think it's really important for when, you know, if your dog gets sick or injured, they already have this trusting relationship with the staff, right? Mm-hmm. They've already come to establish that we can trust these people and something bad doesn't always happen when we're at the vet. Sometimes good things happen. <laughs> the vet, yeah, I, you get a cookie. <laughs> yeah. I had a personal friend that, that did that at mm-hmm. the vet center that you worked um, previously, Kathy, and, mm-hmm. and it helped uh, her dog immensely. Yeah. I know who you're um, talking about. It was yes. Yeah. Yep. And this was a, this was a rescue, mm-hmm. uh, German shepherd who was super, super, super nervous yeah. Now, she will, the owner says, lay down, and the dog will lay down on her side, and 
allow for a full exam. It's, it's amazing how it really benefited that job, transformation. Right? Yeah. That, that happened there. It just made it so much better for the dog and so much better for us too, you know, and then you can get out of there real quick too. You know? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's wonderful. And it is like what we've been talking about, about how dogs have such a sophisticated emotional system they're so often understanding that this predicts this. And so every time I, you know, the vet is always like scary. The vet is always touching me and I don't like it. Right. So you end up, that's what training is doing a lot of times is it's taking away that predictable pattern. That's negative one and replacing it with positive steps along the way. So that when the negative thing happens, it's tossed in there with a whole lot of yummy, great experiences. Um, and so it's much easier to tolerate. I also wanted to add, in addition to these chin rests and this, these body handling commands, um, making it easier for us to work with the dog and making the dog or cat calmer, part of it is also that we're giving back control to the animal. So they are actively getting into these positions yeah. on their own. Mm -hmm. And if you imagine, again, you went to the doctor and rather than saying, can you lift up your arm or even telling you what they're about to do, they just grab your arm or grab your leg and kind of are manipulating you. Even so if it scary. doesn't hurt yeah. and you actually know why they're doing it, it is scary and uncomfortable to not have a warning that this is going to happen mm -hmm. or, or um, just doing it without asking you. And it's, it is huge for animals to be able to choose to do something like, can you move your leg? Sure, yes. But if somebody were to grab my leg, I'd be like, what are you doing? Hey. Stop that. Yeah. yeah. It's rude. It's rude. One of, the, one of the biggest things in, in physical rehabilitation was uh, the command to stand because mm -hmm. so many of the things that, that I wanted to do with them, uh, whether it was exam and or uh, therapeutic exercises started from a standing position. And again, if you had a dog that was fearful or, uh, you know, then their, their instinct is to, to maybe, you know, go to the ground, tuck up, everything gets tight and, and tucked under, um, you know, so you can't even, you know, get a good sense of what's going on in a limb or a joint or, or what have you. But um, also uh, just being able to, like you said, Lillian, ask them to stand and versus hoisting them up into the standing position to precede whatever it was that I was going to do, even with an exercise. So using, you know, the treat lure, teaching them to stand, because a lot of times when I would get out the treat, attempting to positively reinforce, auto sit, right? Everybody's dog, you know, knows how to sit. They see that treat, they know what's coming, you know, they want me to sit. And I'd be like, no, <laughs> you know, I want you to actually stand, you know, so how do you, how do you do the opposite? So that's something that I've really been talking to a lot of uh, pet owners that I interact with is, is teach them how to, to stand uh, as, as strongly and predictably as you teach them to sit. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering about, um, we talked a lot about our dogs and, and the tolerance for body handling, but what about, what about cats? You know, can we, can we, get them or can we teach them to have their body handled much like dogs? You know, in, in cats, we certainly know that there's a relation between their emotional health and their physical health. Certainly when we talk about things like, like urinary disease, urinary um, incontinence, uh, and things like that, uh, you know, that, that there's a direct, direct correlation between some of these ca cats and their emotional health and, and the disease. Can we teach these cats this? Um, you know, I, I went to a lecture not that long ago where the the, the veterinarian put a video camera in a cat carrier to show you what the perspective was like from the cat's view of getting in the carrier and going to the vet. And it was very eye-opening. It was like, wow, that's terrifying. <laughs> huh. Yeah. For cats, for cats, in a lot of ways, going to the vet is much more stressful because they're a lot more territorial. So they've been moved into a completely different place. They also go in the car less often in general. So their fuse, as we like to say, is hugely burnt up by going to the vet. So by the time they're there, they are already not in a good place. So certainly friendly visits, or I've heard them called victory visits for <laughs> cats are just as, if not more important. Mm -hmm. And working on body handling with them, especially, especially if you would like them not to claw your furniture, getting <laughs> um, foot handling, all that stuff can be done the same way with positive reinforcement. I have kittens right now and I'm working on them tolerating me holding a foot and clipping a couple of nails while they're eating. And then I let go and I put their foot back down and they're allowed to keep eating. If they move away, I stop. They're also very little. So cats are often picked up and not given the, the choice. choice. Yeah. So um, teaching your cats to get into the carrier on their own, 
teaching them to get out of the carrier, all those things, uh, like little, little cues can be super helpful for them. And I think Chris had some cat patients in physical rehab, right? That actually came to the clinic. Yep. Yeah. So they'll do it. There are a few that will do it. Many more would do it if they had been given um, more experience and more training. Um, but we did have a few stars uh, when I was there as well. Um, we even considered an underwater treadmill for them. We, mm -hmm. And we prepared them for it by putting them in it once with nothing happening and stuff like that. So cats would hugely benefit <laughs> from yeah. Yeah. Uh, better preparation. And they're less likely to go to the vet because owners are more concerned about them having a bad time because they, they tend to react poorly because they have not been prepared at all, like dogs it's, are. It's much more difficult to get the cat owner in, and, and for that very reason, just even catching them sometimes and putting them in the carrier. And for our listening uh, audience, if you haven't um, heard our interview with Lillian, please go and listen to that with her, um, where she rehabs this cat named Sal. So it's a fantastic interview. Yes. Uh, tripod cat. Yes. Thank you. Or tripod. That's what we call it. That's what you called. <laughs> mm -hmm. So a, a couple things I would like to touch on um, before we wrap up here. One, we've mentioned the car a couple of times and, you know, that's something too that fits into this scenario that I think people often don't think about. So if every time your pet gets in the car, something negative happens, like going to the vet, they're going to hate the car. So, you know, not just going for the, the victory visits at the, at the vet, but going to other places, go out and get, you know, a doggy ice cream, go, you know, on a walk in a different place where you drive them, you know, to a trail, um, you know, make positive things follow that car ride correct? Yes, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And you can also play games with them where you just leave the car in your driveway and you're tossing a treat in there, go find it. You could mm. use to have mm. them come out. I've had dogs before who were nervous. And so we would just leave the car there and have both doors open, maybe the hatchback, you know, even like mm. if your dog's good off leash, you could have that or, or like you could have them on leash, but let them go in, let them explore, let them find something good, let them sit down if they want. Let them do a touch command or a sit or a down, something where they're getting to control their own body. Let them get out when they want to. Yay, in and out, you know, like those. Mm -hmm. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fun. And one thing I wanted to say too about the cat carrier is um, I'm not, I'll look it up and we'll put it on our show notes, but there is a, a new design in, in really? cat carriers. And yes, my vet friend, our vet friend, Dr. Beth Ennis okay. has one for her, her cat and it's this dome and yeah. yeah. And then like, it's a bed and she leaves it open. Her cat loves it. He goes in, that's where he sleeps all the time. And then you just gently bring the top over and zip it up and, and zip it up. Yep. And the whole, the, the visual field is like 360, I think, you know, because it's like this mesh, um, covering and uh so again making you know travel in that because that's his bed that's a comfortable thing versus right. having to put them you know through this small door in this carrier that they've never been before and every time they go in there it's bad. oh gosh and then you got to try to pull them out when they get to the yes. bed and you know try and you know pull them out but if you could just take the cover off gently yes. um, rather than just that zip it back in. yep yes yeah. definitely put that in the show notes i gotta see that yeah hey, those are called sleepy pod thank sleepy you pod? thank you sleepy yeah. pod Awesome. Um, one more thing is that um, we haven't talked about the importance of the drop it or leave it command. And I remember my previous dog went through a um, training to be certified as a therapy dog. And th there were four basic commands or, or behaviors that they had to display. And that was one of them. And I was really surprised. And, but duh, once they pointed it out to me, they're like, well, you know, she could be going into you know, a school, a hospital, a nursing home, it could be medications on the floor that could be lethal for her, that could be a needle. And then, you know, that really brought it home in that context, you know, why of all the things that this dog may need to learn, it, that was the top four. So can we talk about why that's so important in other contexts? Sure. Yeah. I think um, drop it and leave it are great. So I tend to differentiate the two. So for me, drop it means the dog has something in their mouth and I want them to actually open their mouth and release it. Leave it means I don't want you to put that thing in your mouth. I don't want you to get that thing. Um, and so I train them a little bit different. For example, like training drop it, I might use a food lure at the dog's nose. They're like, oh, I can't hold my ball and get the treat. So I think I'll open my mouth and just get the treat. 
Um, something like leave it, we actually teach the dog through what's called doggy zen. So holding a treat in your hand, closing your hand, and then when the dog pulls away from it is when they get that yes, and then the treat. Um, and, and leave it is so important for walks, especially if you live in a city or a crowded area, there's chicken bones on the sidewalk that right. can really hurt them. There, I had a, a little rotty puppy who was vacuuming up cigarette buds. Oh, oh. Her mom was like, I'm traumatized. And I had no idea how many there were, but they're everywhere. Right. And so we worked on um, Leave It. And after two times, her dog had stopped doing it. And she was able, but it was like, oh my gosh, that's the worst idea ever, dog. Um, <laughs> I wonder what was so special about cigarette butts for this no, rotty puppy. <laughs> Or some, the mm. first one maybe had some food left over. The person was eating and smoking and then mm. made yeah. them want to eat the other ones thinking maybe there's like a chicken taste. I don't know. And it, um, just, and it happens so fast, right? It yeah. happens so fast. So having that command is so important. I was walking my dog once and I was walking straight ahead and I looked down. He had half a sandwich in his mouth that he found <laughs> on the ground. Like, where did that well, How did this happen? Um, so that leave it or drop it at that point with the sandwich, drop it, you know, um, and not in, he wasn't in trouble. I didn't give him a uh, drop it. I was like, okay, drop it, you know, mm -hmm. and he dropped it, thankfully, but it yeah. happens so fast. It happens so fast. Yeah. And another example that I'll give for like why this is helpful is um, I worked with a chocolate lab who loved tennis balls. She loved that. That was what she did her whole life. And then at some point she she had a neck shoulder injury. She was not allowed to play fetch anymore because of all that hard stopping and starting on the ground. She was she was okay to play fetch in the water. So she was able to swim. So we've had That was a great therapist who who worked with it that. It was. Dog. Yes. Yeah. He happened to work with Chris. Chris and I both worked with the dog Zena, a wonderful wonderful dog. But Zena and I could go walk around Fresh Pond she was a great dog that off leash, which is another skill that I just enjoy. She would pick up tennis balls all along the way and I would tell her to drop it and she would. And you know what, what happens is, you know, sometimes dogs who don't know a drop command will chew on a tennis ball. I've known dogs who've swallowed tennis balls. This can mm. be not a good thing, right? But Zena could drop the tennis ball and then finally we get over to the little pond. It was like, okay, now you get to play fetch in this responsible way by swimming. And so she would, you know, we would get to play with the ball finally. Um, but that drop it is another way that it was just really helpful to have that great back and forth with her um, because she didn't understand why she couldn't play fetch on land anymore. Yeah. That didn't make sense to her. I can't tell her. <laughs> but that yeah. almost became a little game. Like she'd pick it up, you'd say drop it, and then she'd get rewarded. You know, you're like, good girl, drop, you know. And and so then she's like, oh, this is fun, you know, versus the, the thing that was harmful for her body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I think we talked about everything we could think of, Chris. <laughs> I'm sure there's <laughs> tons a, more, but tons more that could be another show. But you know, as we're closing and wrapping up, um, guys, is there any any one you know takeaway that you would like to um, our audience to leave with our audience today? Um, so I do have one, and I think I meant to mention it earlier, but the the idea is that it, it again is a feedback loop with behavior. So having good behavior and preparing your dog or cat with good foundational skills is going to prevent injury through preventing them from <clears throat> pulling or running into the road, pulling too hard on the, the leash and getting a neck injury, things like that. It's also going to keep you calmer and more in control. It's going to create a positive bond so that they're wanting to listen to you. And then if your dog does have an injury, it's going to make that rehabilitation faster. They're not going to injure themselves during recovery. They're going to be able to settle down in the house when they are on on um, on bed rest, I guess. Mobility control. I don't know what the word I was looking yeah, for. Restricted activity. Yeah. 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 So it basically it helps you prevent the injury. And then if the injury does happen, it helps them recover. And it is way better to do these things ahead of time and to keep working on them when things are good so that you have them in your back pocket when things are bad. Amy, do you have anything to add? Yeah, yeah, I've got something. So I keep thinking about what Lillian was saying about just animals having their own control and feeling more relaxed when they have control of their situation. And I think that's so true and so good and why like I really love being a trainer because I am giving like I'm giving a, a person the tools to teach their dog how to communicate and how to, you know, how to work together. And the dog can make a lot of choices and can do a lot of things. I'm always like saying, dogs are so smart. You don't even know how smart your dog is. Like he's so smart. You know, you're so surprised that he can do the one command that we just worked on first, but actually he can do all these things. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it is like 
thinking about that. Like we're giving the animal more control of the environment, more choice, and that's a really nice thing for them and, and for, their, for their emotional health. Right. For a happier life, a happier, more joyful life. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. And, and, it, and bottom line, it, it, we're always training the people. You know, mm-hmm. we always say that you're not training the, the pet, we're training the people. And uh, so, you know, I love, I love this whole show because I think it's one of the reasons why I really gravitated toward physical rehabilitation because I know in undergrad, I was almost a psychology major and I feel mm-hmm. like working with animals is that perfect, you know, kind of marriage between the, the psychology, the behavior, the training and the physical therapy skills that I learned, you know, in PT school and then, then became certified in, in physical rehabilitation for pets. So, you know, it, it, I just, I love this stuff. I could talk about it all day long. Yeah. And I think that uh, I would agree. I think that's one of the reasons I sort of gravitated towards rehab as well. I, I, one of the things is that, that there's not only an emotional benefit to physical rehab or rehabilitation, but one of the things that I found also interesting is that there's a great emotional re- rehab being done for owners as well. So when, um, when our dogs are, are, like you said, when, when people are calm and our dogs are calm, everything is good. Um, so I think there's a good, uh, it continues a, a bonding experience with, with people and their animals to be able to do that, you know, so mm-hmm. that's kind of mm-hmm. the reasons I gravitate towards rehab as well. Yes. Well, great show. Um, I just wanted to let our listeners know again where to find you, and that's behaveatlanta.com is your website. And virtual visits are very helpful. So if you're not in the Atlanta area, then you can still schedule to uh, glean from the expertise of these professional trainers and behaviorists from wherever you might be. And the website also includes a plethora of resources from toys and products that they love and recommend to awesome and informative blogs and articles. And uh, so uh, check it out, behaveatlanta.com. I'm really excited about those virtual visits. I'm going to send people over there. Good. Yes. Thank yes. you. <laughs> yeah, we're happy. We're happy to meet with people. We, we love that we can do it internationally now, nationally and internationally. It's fantastic. Yes. Fantastic. Yes. Thank you guys so much. Thank you Thank for your you. time. Thank Wonderful. You. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed our show. Follow us on Facebook or on Instagram at Petability Podcast. For more information about Kathy's books and living with blind dogs, please go to enableyourpet.com. Thank you and please tune in next time.